So it is Galaxy S21, S21 Ultra time. And I've been making a transition. I've been goofing around. I've been messing around. You have. And yeah, I'm switching over. And it's actually kind of a big jump scale wise because I was on, I wasn't even on the Max iPhone. I was coming from the, the little pro iPhone. Mm. So the S21 Ultra feels huge. The screen feels huge. And the biggest thing that I'm noticing as well is with the refresh rate. I told you that on yesterday's episode. However, yes. there's a few things on the latest S21 devices that are uh, th a few things missing from the previous generations. A few things that I really appreciated on previous generations. It's oh. missing. What's that? But before I get into those things, Will, oh. I want to I want to talk about something that was actually a good decision that they made. I'm going to start out on a high note. They got a tighter integration and a, a tighter relationship with Google to the point where they're going to natively have Google messages instead of their own text messaging app, mm. which is a thing I always had to do anyways on my own. I have to go and install regular Google messages because I don't want to use, well, really any brand's version of it. That's including the fact that Google messages now supports the better version of texting RCS rather than rather than old fashioned regular SMS. Mm. So they got a tighter integration. They made some sort of an agreement to fix the behavior of Google Messages to to have it more integrated into One UI on the latest generation, and to pre-install it. So right out of the box, you click the Messages app, and you are into Google Messages instead of Samsung Messages. However, this is not the default experience for the United States for some reason. Hmm. And I think you can include Canada in that because the default messaging app on my version, which I believe came from Samsung Canada, it's also Samsung Messages. Oh. Now, I don't know what kind of restrictions might exist around, like, I don't know why North America doesn't have Android's native Google Messages app in there, but there's nothing stopping you from putting it on. And once you do put it on, it's going to have that same level of integration as if it were to have come pre-installed. Hmm. Of course, we talk so much about the messaging wars going on, the mass exodus from uh, WhatsApp, and everybody's trying to figure out how and where they're going to do their messaging. I believe... Many others have adopted Google Messages over some custom messaging app. OnePlus did that recently, if I recall. So I applaud all of this. I like the idea of, uh, well, there's something about using the application developed by the operating system developer mm -hmm. when it comes to certain core or important functions. And so I've always been a fan of the native messages by, by Google comparatively. And uh, and with oh by the way along with RCS comes a better experience for sending multimedia for sending images and video and things like this so it's uh, it's not all the way there it's not iMessage yet but as it emerges as a standard on Android it's gonna get better will and more people are gonna be using it and benefiting from it and all the rest and it has the context built in with the Google Assistant which mm. Google Assistant I miss so much on iOS. I got to put that out right. there. I miss it quite a bit. Hmm. Uh, and I think I'm going to get back into Google Assistant in a big way. And it seems like Samsung is kind of embracing it. Also, if you swipe left, it brings up the, not Google News. They have a new name for it. What is it? Google Now, Google Recommended. What is it hmm. when you swipe left on a, on a, on a Pixel device? And you Something see the, Google comes It's up. a feed. You know the whole yeah. feed? Google feed? Latest news, Google, updates, notifications. Google Now, Google. No, it used to be called Google Now once upon a time. Am We're I going to look this up? Are we going to look into this or not? Are we going to get to the bottom of this or not? Google, Google Feed, Google Discover Feed. Okay, we were close. Google Discover Feed. So, yeah, that's on there natively. So, anyway, I applaud all that. And don't worry, though. I'm going to get into the things that this device is missing. That's coming up right after our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Honey. I mean, you know about Honey. Stop it. Honey is this dead simple 
addition to Chrome. It is free. You install it on any computer that's out there. It's super simple. And it does what it says. It just saves you money. That's it. It scans the web for coupon codes when you're shopping. You don't even have to think about it. You're just about to buy something, order something, and Honey clicks in and it starts to scan and bring up the available coupon codes, inserts them. It's all in one kind of rewarding motion that it takes place. And then you check out as you would have done anyways. No extra time to you, except you save money. You put the money back in your pocket, Willie Do That's how mm -hmm. it works. Uh, it's a free browser extension. It scours the entire internet for promo codes, automatically tests them when you're checking out. So you don't need to type in each one independently to see if it's going to work or not. Uh, you get Honey on your computer for free in two easy clicks. Then when you're checking out on one of its over 30,000 supported sites, Honey pops up and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds and that's that, Willie Do. If Honey finds a working code, it'll apply the best one to your cart. And you said you encountered this exact experience recently when you were shopping on Burton because you're a big did, snowboard yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, bought a jacket and I saved a couple bucks. Look at you. Mm -hmm. Honey has found over 17 million members and over 2 billion in savings. All kinds of retailers are on there from tech to gaming to fashion and even food delivery. It's simple. If you have a computer, Honey should be on it. You can get Honey for free today at joinhoney.com slash lulater. That is joinhoney.com slash lulater. And you got to put the Lou later part so that they know we sent you. You can click the link in the description or you can just type it in. Joinhoney.com slash Lou later. Get Honey for free today. All right, here's the first thing that's missing. And this is my biggest, this is the biggest one for me. This is a missing on the S21 products. It's MST for contactless payments. And for many years, I spoke on how Samsung Pay had this huge advantage over all the other payment apps because it worked on every single machine, not just machines that supported NFC. If you bumped into a payment terminal, this was going to work on it because it was able to convince the terminal through a magnetic component. It was able to convince the terminal that the card was physically there even when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you really liked it. I just loved that idea that it was tricking the machine. And if you ever bumped into an old machine, I don't know where you're at then you never, I never had the fear, Will, that I, if I were to travel without my wallet, that I could be in a pinch and bump into an old machine and just be like, oh, uh, oops. Yeah. Like have one of those moments. Mm -hmm. Now those moments are happening less and less because everyone's upgrading the machines. Mm -hmm. Contactless payments is all the rage right now, particularly the world situation going on. No one wanting to touch anything. Contactless payments. Google Pay, Apple Pay, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so Samsung's sitting there saying, well, if all the NFC is there, we're still going to have Samsung Pay on here. We're still going to support Google Pay if people prefer. I don't think we need that MST anymore. Hmm. And so they got rid of it. They got rid of it in the U.S., confirmed. It's not on the spec sheet. I think they got rid of it here. And in some markets, they'll, make, they'll keep it. Probably the markets that don't have the updated uh, payment terminals or where it's right. more likely to run into one that still uses the right. mag strip, no NFC, et cetera. So... It loses a bit of an advantage. I get it. We're, we're, we're a little bit past the need for it in most circumstances, but it gave me an extra level of confidence. Well, and it, it helped me to recommend Samsung Pay to people. And yeah. now, now I don't even know. I'll probably just use Google Pay. Right. Instead. Because I've already, I mean, I have that set up too. Tell me what the advantage is now, Samsung. You said, yeah, based on your past history, you, uh, you were quite impressed with it. And you like impressing others. Well, this that's exactly like, what happened. That's this. exactly what happened, Will, is I would be in a circumstance, he'd be like, you can't tap my machine right now. Like, like don't some, tell me what to do. Somebody at the checkout. It would work. Somebody at the checkout would say to me, don't you dare tap my machine. It doesn't have tap. And I would say, it does now. And I would tap my Samsung Pay, and they'd be like, what? And it would make their day and they would be, it was all mysterious. And then I walk out and I would throw my scarf and, you yeah. know, I'm a magician basically because uh, yeah. I had MST. Anyway, it's not in the latest models. It's a bit unfortunate. It's not the end of the world. The next thing that's missing that this is more, I didn't use this as much, but a lot of people reached out to me on this, the micro SD card. 
is gone on all Galaxy S21 models. And uh, it's the first time in a long time. It's the first time since the Galaxy S6, I think. So going back, this has been something that Samsung liked to support. Now, I do, I mean, obviously we have more storage inside of the device when you buy it than we've had on previous models. You have the choice between 128, 256, all the way up to 512. But the thing is, Will, oftentimes it was cheaper to expand your storage when you needed it later, as opposed to having to buy the big storage out the gate. And the ex expandable, the, uh, the micro SD storage, if you were to buy it when you needed it, chances are the storage prices would be down uh, significantly from the point at which you purchased the phone. So there was kind of a value proposition there with micro SD. And I don't know what people are storing on their phones, Presumably videos, presumably uh, not wanting to use the cloud services. A lot of these cloud services now are charging you a monthly fee. Huh. And if you take a lot of photos and shoot a lot of videos, you're going to run out of even 128. I mean, we were talking about, well, I know on the Ultra model, which shoots 8K, or do they all shoot 8K this they year? Do, yes. They all shoot 8K. You are you got no storage on 128. You're dead on 128 with 8K. Yeah. So it's just something to keep in mind. You may want to boost your storage. If that's a big thing for you, and unfortunately, micro SD is not going to be an option this time around. Apple is planning upgraded MacBooks. I don't know if you knew this. You probably assumed it. MacBook Pros. I think you're, you went one article too far there. That's actually the Mac Pros. Back one more. There you go. Upgraded MacBook Pros and Mac Pros, which we're going to get to next. What's cool about the MacBook Pro report here from Mark Gurman on Bloomberg he has somebody uh, close. What, how, how do you describe one of these people? Somebody with knowledge on the matter. A Ming Chi. An Apple spokeswoman didn't immediately respond to requests for comment. That's a way of saying, see, oh. it's a secret. They don't want to tell us. No, but he had, oh, a person with knowledge of the plans. Listen to that. That's when you know, that's a real reporting right there. Yeah. Person with knowledge of the plans. Anyway. Uh, here's the cool things. You're going to love this, Will. Next generation MacBook Pro. We all know we're going to get more cores. We all know it's going to be the M stuff going in there with the chip and the custom or Apple generated, Apple manufactured silicon, ma manufactured, designed, whatever way you want to put it. Uh, we knew they were going to be powerful, but listen to this. How about the comeback of MagSafe, the magnetic yes. charge port? Finally. That's cool. Why didn't they ever get rid of that? That was great. Yeah. I understand you want to go type C. Okay, type C is fine. Have the type C, but then still have the MagSafe. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Anyway, they got rid of it for whatever reason. Supposedly on this next gen, they're going to do a barrel style connector and it's going to charge faster than type C. And nice. you get the magnet back for when you, when you kick it. So that's great. There's also the rumor that they're going to get rid of the touch bar, which many people just haven't really liked all that much, prefer the physical keys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and also the old keyboard. So, Apple, weirdly, on the laptops, they go backwards to go forwards. Old keyboard, old MagSafe, and no touch bar. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. New chips, though, which is the important part. Right. Also, the screen is supposed to get brighter and better, and the two models, there should be... So, so there's supposed to be two Pro models, 14-inch and 16-inch are the new sizes oh. as well. So I don't know how you feel about that compared to uh, having the 13.3... Gets a little bit larger, but hopefully they shrink those bezels. And I bet you the footprint is going to be, once they figure that right. out, it should be roughly the same. Yeah. Another part of this rumor, they're going to rework the uh, the Air model, but uh, nobody has a, there's no timeline on that. The MacBook Pros are going to be next because they're a bit outdated at the moment. Now, speaking of the desktop models, apparently Apple is working on two new Mac Pro desktops. And what's interesting is they're going to do one to just replace what's currently out there. In fact, the rumor on that one is that it's still going to carry Intel inside, which is kind of weird and interesting. Maybe for the pro customer, there's too too many compatibility gaps right now. I don't know. I'm Maybe not sure. The deal with Intel is uh, still there. Some deal with Intel is still. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why that's the report, but I, I presume they just want to keep something Intel in the lineup for for some reason for a little bit longer so yeah so the rumor is the big boy will still have some intel inside and then they'll do another version of the mac pro which will be tiny a little cube inspired by that old g4 cube 
and that's what's going to have the M stuff in it, hmm. and that's what's going to be the next generation for them of pro computers. Apple is testing chips with as many as 32 performance cores for its desktop computers and 16 to 32 core graphics options. Then the highest end, end machines uh, could be 64 and 128 core GPUs, which would be several times faster than graphics options that Apple currently uses from AMD. So there is no timeline on this. Apple Silicon, the, the Apple Silicon Mac Pro was planned to launch by 2022. So this could still be a little ways off. But uh, yeah, if you're if you're holding out, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's worthwhile to uh, to delay a little bit. These these things are expensive. Some of these workstations and uh, all the excitement is around Apple's own silicon. It would be tough to really uh, put down on a Mac Pro right now mm -hmm. for those type of funds. When you're curious, sitting around and waiting, and you might be actually more interested in one of those MacBook Pros right now, depending on your workflow and what you do. Uh, for us, we've recognized the advantages of the M1 chip in the form of the even the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Yeah, even the Mac Mini. Even the Mac Mini. Yeah, there's that. So there's some options there, but you, you don't worry. The Pro models are on their way. Netflix is reportedly testing spatial audio support for AirPods Pro and AirPods Max. Now, this one, to me, is a kind of a killer functionality. I was goofing with this stuff today, actually, because I'm working on a video... AirPods Pro versus Galaxy Buds Pro, which is the comparison you would expect. The Galaxy Galaxy Buds Pro just came out. They have Pro in the name. So I was curious about it. I just started testing. I'm going to shoot a video on Monday, actually, because I want to spend a little bit more time. But one thing that struck me about the presentation and having goofed with the Buds Pro is the fact that they support a similar head tracking function to spatial audio, but it is not tied to any specific service, but instead to just any Dolby feed. It's mm. Dolby Atmos, and they even call it Dolby Head Tracking. So it seems like a standard that would be available to, well, a large number of streaming services. On Apple's side, for the time being, their spatial feature has been with movies purchased directly from Apple, and there's been a couple streaming services added, but not Netflix. Netflix is already working with the Galaxy Buds. So you wonder if Apple reached out to Netflix and said, oh, let's get working on this feature. Let's get this thing going too. There's no reason our stuff shouldn't work within Netflix, especially since it's already working on Apple TV+, Plus, Hulu, and Disney+. Plus. They're supporting spatial audio. Now, you know... I'm a huge fan of spatial audio. I think it is. I think it really changes the level of immersion when you're watching a movie or a show on mobile that happens to have Dolby. It's a whole different experience. So what's coming up in the video I'm going to shoot on Monday is the comparison of the two to see where they're at. And Netflix bringing support for Apple's version of spatial audio is only going to make this feature more important to people because now... Well, the variety of content you consume supports it. It's more of a reason for you to have it. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I guess it's good news for Netflix, good news for Apple, good news for both. Uh, Xiaomi, you sent this to me. Everybody was telling me about this. Uh, Xiaomi got blacklisted in, in uh, the U.S. I mean, Trump is on his way out, but he's still got stuff going on as far as uh, banning is concerned or blacklisting is concerned. Now, Xiaomi sort of responded disputing the blacklist the claim here is that Xiaomi has ties to uh, the Chinese military. That's the claim from the U.S. government. Obviously, Xiaomi, an enormous smartphone maker at this point, I think, sitting in number three most recent numbers for global smartphone shipments. Huge in places like India, where we have a large audience, many people familiar with the company. They put out this announcement on Twitter which we, you and I were reading earlier, we're like, whoa, this seems really uh, legal, really professional. I'm not sure what, how fans are going to take this piece of information in a positive light or, or, or whatnot, but they're trying to defend themselves by the looks of it, saying we're not affiliated with the mm -hmm. Chinese military at all. Please chill out. Of course, the market responded, and, uh, and the company plunged a record 10% after this blacklist. 
They are China's number two smartphone maker. There were more companies included in this blacklist. Uh, and who knows? I guess, are these things upheld when Trump leaves office? Does Biden go and look at it and create his own rules? Or does he uphold whatever has been uh, already put in place? It's it's hard to know. But there are so many affiliations that exist. Like, for example, Qualcomm is an investor in Xiaomi and a, and a huge supplier. There's mm. all kinds of relationships where huge American companies would not want one of their partners to be in this particular position or where one of their partners like Xiaomi could apply pressure to the government via their supplier, Qualcomm, mm. their partner, Qualcomm, who could go pick up the phone and be like, hey, we're trying to do some stuff here. Now, obviously, that wasn't the case with Huawei, who kind of got buried by this thing. So we'll have to wait and see how it pans out for Xiaomi. But for the time being, they're saying no Chinese military. Give us a break. It's all good. That's at least what they're saying. Mm. So we talked like two episodes ago about how Apple might get into the premium podcast arena, come play ball against the likes of Spotify and Amazon and all these different companies paying for podcasts, premium podcasts, looking for a subscription from you. From me? Yeah, from you. Oh. And of course, I thought it was weird because Apple has had the default podcast app dating back to iPods. They created it. And yet they have no premium play. It's like, wait a second, you got the Apple Music. What are we doing here? Can we merge it together? What's about to happen? So these rumors emerge via report from the information and then posted here on Mac Rumors. Uh, apparently, they could be working on a paid podcasting service like Spotify, Sirius, and Amazon. They could uh, go out of their way to buy or license high-profile podcasts or... They may be working on original podcasts in the same way they've done with Apple TV Plus, where they could build them from the ground up. As you know, Spotify spent a fortune around $800 million buying podcasts, including uh, The Ringer, Gimlet Media, and mm -hmm. our pal Joe Rogan. Uh, well, his podcast isn't purchased. it's uh, He has a licensing deal, presumably. But... In order to attract attention to those to, the, to that variety of platforms. So I guess Apple wants to take a crack at it, increasingly a services business. This is just a report at the moment. But for me, if they're going to add another service, this would be the easiest one. The question is, would it be a dedicated application, Podcasts Plus, a separate subscription, or would it somehow be tangled up with music, Apple Music? I don't There's know. There's probably going to be a bundle. There's bun they're bundling a, combo, a lot of things. They're a bundling a platter. lot of things these days. Now, speaking of Spotify, there, there's an analyst here, City. They do not think Spotify's big bet on podcasts is working out. In fact, they say they think it's failing. Uh, the idea was that by bringing exclusive content to the application, the company could strengthen it, both its advertising business and its premium number of premium subscribers. Because of that, the Stock was doing really well in 2019 and 2020 as they were making these acquisitions. You'd be thinking, oh, that's going to lead to a bunch of subscriptions or at least a bunch of app downloads, mm -hmm. both of which, according to, to City, they're not seeing a material effect on that. Hmm. To date, we have not seen a material positive inflection in app downloads or premium subscriptions. What? Really? That seems hard to believe. I don't know. Now, you and I have been following some of the sentiment on YouTube when Rogan left. We were curious, like, are people going to move over, at least download the app and listen on the free, from the free perspective, maybe not necessarily go premium. City is uh, uh, skeptical that that has happened or will, can, or will happen at any point. The cadence of premium gross additions through quarter three of 2020 and app download data through fourth quarter 2020 do not show any material benefit from recent podcast investments hmm. the analysts wrote the firm then downgraded the stock to sell from neutral this sent spotify stock down more than 6.5 percent at the time of this particular article just tumbling down a little bit there so what does this mean are people not as platform mobile as we might think i know you and i were speaking about how we 
kind of came to the recognition at the same time. We're like, oh, I haven't checked Rogan's podcast in a while because it required a new habit from us to yes. go check Spotify. Mm -hmm. And we're both YouTube music subscribers, so I don't know if we want to add another subscription. Granted, it's there for free. We just have to get the app. But I did this today when I went to download the app, and you still have to log in. You still have to make an account, yes. which Correct. is a little bit of friction for a user. It is free, but you still have to make the account. Which makes me wonder if they shouldn't have a, a super free term or a, a, a super f a free kind of version where you have some limited access to the app prior to making a, an account. Mm. I don't know, because it was that moment there where I was like, maybe I'll just go back to the old way I was listening to things. Yeah. It's just so once you're into a particular habit, particularly with podcasts, because podcasts weren't ever singular to one platform. You could always listen to them anywhere. Uh -huh. That was kind of the point of it. It was across this huge variety of places. Yes. And you add it to your list, every, like each podcast. You listen, yes. And your list kept growing and, yep. and you, ha you had a bunch of stuff to choose from. So it's a bit tough to figure out exactly what's going on. Maybe it will take some time for people to build new habits, but it is a curious thought that maybe these audiences aren't as mobile as we originally thought. And also another thing we could consider is that maybe the content marketplace is so vast and the supply is so much that people would just click on something else. Mm -hmm. And again, that would that would uh, wreck their mobility to go across platforms because they'd be like, there's 10,000 more things to interact with over here. So it's different models resulting in different outcomes, but uh, we'll have to wait and see what develops in the future. For the time being, City's not too big on those big acquisitions. Now, this may be a secret weapon for Spotify to change the way things are going. Apparently, they're working on a piece of hardware to sit in the car. They call it the car thing. Okay. And it may or may not end up as a uh, an available product that you can buy, but it has shown up at the FCC for approval. It has a giant knob on it. It looks like a tablet. The premise is some sort of voice-controlled smart assistant that can interact in some way with your smartphone. Obviously, the car is a big way in which people listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. They just spent $800 million on podcasts. Do mm -hmm. they think that maybe by putting a device in your car? Because Sirius and XM, they tried that at one time. Right. You're so angry right now. I'm perplexed. I'm very confused. Okay, just go on. Hey, man. Keep, keep going. So it's Bluetooth enabled for communication with the car head unit powered from a 12 volt outlet. The design, uh, it looks like a mini tablet with some kind of button and a large knob. There's probably some sort of a screen in it. Uh, there's a few more pictures down there if you want to see some okay. different angles. They did not say for sure that there, this is going to be a piece of hardware that they're actually going to sell. Here's a quote from Spotify. Spotify is focused on becoming the world's number one audio platform, and we're continuing tests of a voice-controlled music and podcast device to help us learn more about how people listen to audio in the car, the company said in a statement to The Verge. While we don't have any further news to share at this time, we're always testing and seeking feedback from our users, rolling out new features and products. You do not believe in this device, Willie Do. What? How is this different from your phone screen? That's it has a big knob on it, Will, it for just volume. Has a big knob. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's a game changer. Your phone well, doesn't have in. a big knob, all right. And like cars will have bigger screens. I know. You know. I know. Where is this gonna fit? You're so angry right uh, now. I'm just really confused. I. Yeah. And for a software company to go to, you know, make hardware is really hard. Hence the name. <laughs> I was going to so say... I'm very confused. I was going to say, you know, maybe it's more experimental than you think. Maybe it's super early yeah, and they sure. don't make a smartphone. So maybe it's true. They're just testing some features with a dedicated piece of hardware. Maybe that's all it is, Will. I mean, that okay. seems crazy. Why couldn't you just test with a regular smartphone mounted exactly. in a car? No. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, maybe. How about this? Maybe they eventually make the pitch to be installed into the head unit. Yeah, that would make sense. And this is a way of 
getting closer to that. Anyway, I don't know. Right. But look, they're looking for ways to live, to survive in this crazy future in which yeah. you're going up. Spotify is small compared to its competitors. Mm. You're talking about Apple and Amazon and yikes, man. Yes. You imagine the stress on a day-to-day of being Spotify? It's oh. the biggest players in the world. It's uh-huh. Google, Apple, and Amazon. Those are your competitors. Wow. Well, let's just see how this goes. We got a little WhatsApp update. So WhatsApp is going to delay its privacy changes. Did you just get paywalled? Goodness gracious. Did we buy the New York Times yet? I can't remember. No, we didn't. That's another subscription we have to add to our $10,000 a year of subscriptions that we have. For the purpose of the show, we do it for you guys. Anyway, uh, WhatsApp has delayed privacy changes amid the backlash, which I think, by the way, is, well, it's an obvious move Mm. because you're hoping for things to just simmer down a little bit. Yes. And you may still have identical plans, but you just, you're like, you know what? Take some time. Think about it. Keep using the app. Keep loving it. In the meantime, we'll give you some more features. We'll get you more hooked. And then when you see the thing the second time around, we can't do the news all over again. So we'll just delay it. So what they're going to do is move these changes to May 15th from February 8th so that people have more time to to make their plans around what they're going to choose to do. Now, they at the same time have said, trust us, this stuff is not as bad as it was originally sounding. It's only between nothing changes for you. It's between you and businesses and whatever else. But hey, how come we can't opt out? No, 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 just, we're just, hey, just chill for a bit. It's May 15th. Now that's so far in the future. You don't even need to think about it. Just keep using the app. Please just okay. keep using the app. M- make sure you keep using the app and then we'll hit you with a little update at some point later on when you no longer care. Yeah. So they're going to do the thing of just putting it on pause for now, trying to make their case. I don't know how successful it will be. We talked about the huge download numbers i think signal was actually down today for a period of time a few people tweeted me showing me that uh, they couldn't send and receive messages getting bombarded and this was one of the things one of the fears people had around a company that is not uh, for profit a company that is a non-profit organization you we, people there's some curiosity i guess around scale and Ability to maintain services at an astronomical in- increase in user count. I'm sure they'll figure it out, but for the time being, they're just getting bombarded. And you wonder what will happen if people have outages for a period of time. Do they just flip back to WhatsApp and they're like, fine, I need to send this message. Take my privacy. <laughs> but remember, there's also Telegram out there. You give that one a there shot, but. So I think it's just hot at Signal right now. Give them some time to increase their capacity. This story changed in the time from when I added it. It was a it was the first restock of 2021 for PlayStation 5s. Yeah, that sold out, showcasing something that I didn't expect. I had speculated that after the holidays that the supply was going to catch up from some of the stuff I was hearing, but it has not caught up. The heat is still on with PlayStation 5. And the reason I know this is because I'm actually trying to buy a few off the secondary market right now for an upcoming giveaway on Unbox Therapy. That's just a thing oh. that we're trying to do at some point next week. So just make sure you're ready to go and subscribe and all the rest of it. Right. So we're still paying for the ones we're trying to pick up. We're paying like 1100 1200 Canadian. Wow. It's still up there. It's hanging in there. Now, granted, that's only around eight or nine hundred US, but the co- the price is hanging in there, and that shows you that the supply is not caught up. And same thing with this particular report: more units showed up, and they sold out immediately. Now, what was weird about this batch is the only way you could get them was with Sony reward points. Yet hmm. that didn't slow people down. For six fifty six thousand and nine hundred and ninety eight points, you could get one unit per member. And Sony did anticipate the consoles would last longer, but there were enough people ready to go with those points to basically gobble them up immediately, the limited number that Sony had available. So Sony PS5, still hot. 
So hot, in fact, that this postal worker got caught stealing them. Oh. Actually, you know what? I think he was stealing the older PlayStations. I, I think this oh. was prior to PlayStation 5. But, you know, there's been so many stories about, I mean, we covered a lot of them. Weird things showing up in the mail that were supposed to be PlayStations, but then it would be a cinder block or a stack of books or a George Foreman grill. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is one way in which your package goes missing. According to reports, a U.S. Postal Service supervisor has now been sentenced. Uh, 34-year-old from Connecticut discovered to have stolen numerous packages. Numerous. Contained Apple computers, iPhones, Sony PlayStations, and Nintendo consoles. Also stolen packages with footwear and clothing items. Uh, the fine, he got fined $20,000 and sentenced to three years probation with the first nine months to be home confinement. That's not great. Uh, 20 grand though, I'm wondering, I'm sitting there wondering how many electronics he got because he may have got 20 grand worth and then the fine is 20 grand. So yeah, he could have sold them, made the money back. Yeah. I wonder if the fine is commensurate with the actual scale of the theft. It probably is. So, right. But anyway, yeah, that's that's one place that PlayStations went that no one had accounted for, that Sony couldn't help you with. Fitbit is now officially part of the Google family. This has been an acquisition that's been going on or attempting to go on for a while. There had been some regulatory bod bodies that were like, wait a sec, Google's so huge, do we want to let them buy Fitbit? Fitbit's a little one of these little standout companies still existing amongst the various giants. They were like... They were like the Spotify in music to the fitness realm. Mm. And now they're not. Now they're Google, which might upset you, but might also end up being a good thing because you could see improved integration with Android and Google devices and uh, obviously tremendous potential for scale and R&D and all the rest of it because, well, you got Google there now. I'm curious to see what they do with Fitbit. Does it stay completely on its own as Fitbit, and if so, for how long? I've tested some of their devices. I've liked some of their devices, including mm -hmm. the latest Versa product. I mean, I was goofing, or no, the Sense, actually. The highest end model, which can do all the heart stuff and the ECGs and the body temperature and the SpO2 and the sleep and just a lot of sensors packed into that thing. And you know Google wants to get into the health thing as well. So... The question is, does it become a Nest thing? Because didn't all the Nest stuff become Google Home? Or what did they... Yeah. How did they arrange all Google that? products. Like, is Nest still Nest? Or it's Google Nest? I see. So I guess it will be Google Fitbit. Uh, it's still Nest. Oh, yeah. No, no. no it's moved to the Google store. Nest.com no longer operates. So is this, is this the future for Fitbit? It just goes into the Google store and Fitbit.com ceases to exist and it's just a Google brand and it's Google Fitbit. Yeah, I guess so. Probably. Hmm. That's probably what takes place. Google but, ate it up. Yeah, whether it's good or bad, we'll find out, but it at least appears to be official at this point. Another thing Google is doing, they're testing the ability to shop directly from YouTube videos. We talked about this in the past, mm. and it's finally rolling out by the looks of it. There's a little shopping cart that shows up in videos. Only U.S. users currently who access YouTube through Android, iOS, and the web will see the shopping bag icon. So if you click or tap on this icon in the bottom left of the screen, YouTube will display a list of featured items in the video. And then it will attach to uh, the retailers associated with that particular item. And you can add it to your cart within one click. This obviously makes a lot of sense. Many people research products, look at products on YouTube. And then many YouTube personalities sell their own stuff or collaborate with brands and things like this. Some people will find it easy. Others may be critical of such a feature, suggesting that... Uh, I don't know, the, the the site becomes a giant infomercial, which, well, I mean, it kind of is. I don't know. Mm. Is it? It's weird, the connotation around infomercial, because I do so much shopping via YouTube myself, and I don't really right. feel bad. You know what I mean? I would prefer, if I was going to buy something, I would prefer someone on YouTube explain it to me than just go to the website and 
pull the trigger on no you know what i'm saying it's like yeah but some people just want to watch the content maybe if there was like a a high button or something oh i'm sure there'll be know? i'm sure they'll find a way yeah. or an opt out or something like this i read through some of the comments some people were upset about it uh let's see ironic considering most of these so-called influencers do not pay for the stuff they show off and Google does not pay anyone for the data they mine, perhaps pay the consumer and not the damn influencers. So like Brett is upset. And then Chris says, just what we need, more ads and consumerism. But these guys are on Engadget. I mean, what are we really doing here? Yeah. Ads and consumerism. It's called the market. It's called the economy. I don't know. What do you want to do? N none of that? Okay, we'll see how that goes then. Mm. None of that, Will. Let's see how that goes. Try it out. I don't know. Let me know how it goes. One more thing that YouTube is doing. They're uh, implementing voice input on the web, not just on the mobile app. So now you can use nothing but your voice in order to search things, in order to speak commands at your computer screen and not just at your smartphone you just hit the mic button next to the search bar enables the microphone you will have to grant it permission the first time that you use it you can pause and resume the mic by pressing the big mic button you can it's it's actually pretty smart it understands natural language commands such as i don't think this will work play cat videos hello no, I... It you don't have work. a microphone on yeah, that. Yeah, it doesn't have a mic. What am I doing here? Play cat videos. That works. And it can also be used to navigate the YouTube interface. You can ask it to show you your subscriptions, your watch his history, and your library. So that's a nice little touch. Nice little voice input. Uh, I have a story here. A leaked conversation. A leaked Jack Dorsey conversation. Hmm. Uh, Was he talking about Bitcoin? He, I'm, he probably got some Bitcoin in there. Big yeah, Bitcoin yeah. guy. Uh, no, this was about the Trump ban. A lot of people talking about the Trump ban, social media. Free, right now it's the uh, inauguration. Free speech, inauguration talk. Uh, yeah, if all. whether or not social media should be regulated. Um how it all ties in to modern life and whether i mean whether or not social media is more powerful than government since government uses social media mm. social media doesn't use government mm. Whoa. Dorsey's like can we uh stop talking about this political stuff let's go back to talking about bitcoin yeah cash app yeah <laughs> cash app did you ever read the watchmen read it the comic uh, or yes. Is it a comic? No, the graphic, it's a novel. graphic novel. It's a graphic novel. How dare you? Yeah, who watches The Watchmen? Yes. Who watches The Watchmen? Will he do? Anyway, so this guy, somebody inside of Twitter leaked a video call. And in the video call, Dorsey says, we know we are focused on one account right now. This was obviously around the time of the Trump banning. But this is going to be much bigger than just one account. And it's going to go on for much longer than just this day this week and the next few weeks and go on beyond the inauguration. So he was giving a little speech, I guess, to uh, some employees around, I suppose, becoming more active with the banning on Twitter and the policing of Twitter and the type of speech that's going on and, and all the rest of it. Now, on one side of the fence, people say, good, great, get rid of them, threats violence, whatever, all the rest of it. On the other side of the fence, people say, free speech, how dare you? Mm. Control, who gets a microphone and who doesn't? And I have a funny feeling it's going to be like this for a while, mm -hmm. will he do? And uh, Twitter seems to have become kind of the center of the thing. And this guy from Project Veritas, who got the tip in the first place, claims to have all kinds of Dorsey recordings because some people inside of Twitter obviously disagree mm. with Dorsey's policies or else they wouldn't be leaking the video clips or maybe they want some fame or or whatever. Whatever their motivation is, this thing has a long way to go. Tesla's liquidating Model S and X inventory by the end of the month. Huh. Maybe a refresh is finally coming. That would be cool. 
it's been a long time coming. They were supposed to refresh these vehicles a long time ago uh, in 2019. And they never got around to it because they got all caught up with Model 3 and Y. And it was probably a better idea, honestly, for them. They had the limited bandwidth and those were going to be the popular models anyways. But it's weird when your cheaper vehicle feels like your better vehicle. <laughs> Yeah, which I especially said, the interior. Yeah, which I said to you previously. They have they'll sell, they have these really premium price tags for the Model S and Y. You can spec a performance version to like 150 grand. Right. And, and it still has chrome trim. Yeah, exactly. It has the dated chrome trim on the outside, which I know we're nitpick we're nitpicky, but it just feels like a, they could do just a couple updates. They don't have to update the interior change a few style components on the outside. Don't rework the whole thing. Not yeah. necessary. Let's you, let you customize a little bit more. That would be great. And uh, But apparently they want to rework the interior and do a uh, more of a landscape style display because you know they have the vertical display currently. Right. Which mixed, mixed opinions on that. The Model 3 did the landscape display and it just feels a little more functional. Mm -hmm. It's a little more reachable. I don't know. Uh, keep in mind, I haven't spent all that much time in the Model S. I, I did have the Mo I did have the Model Three around here for a day or two as well. But I mean, they're different implementations. But it sounds like they're going to go towards making the Model S and X fit the lineup a little better. Yes, and also improve the luxury aspect of the interior. It seems to be another target for them. So anyway. That's the thinking here is that the reason that they're liquidating the remaining stuff is to make way for some new version that's on the horizon. Back in 2018, the rumors had started about a significant interior design refresh for S and X that never happened. It was delayed. So it's about time. It has to happen at some point. And oh, the other interesting one, they were working on the model, the Plaid Model S to compete with the Taycan. So maybe that one gets thrown into the mix as a build option. That would be fun if that one gets some love as well. Now, speaking of vehicles, you know Ford had to respond to that TRX. Huh. You know they couldn't let that go on its own. The horsepower wars are fully underway when it comes to the pickup trucks. Ram puts out the TRX 702 horsepower, something around there. I got all fired up. I was like, I might have to go check that out. That's what I said. and But I knew that there was going to be some next Raptor, and that's exactly what this report has here. A V8 version, 2021 Ford F-150 Raptor R. 700 plus horsepower, debuting February 3rd. We don't even have to wait long. And the thing is, there's the rumor it could get the engine from the Mustang Shelby GT500. That's a 760 horsepower engine, mm. Mr. Willie Do. So that's a huge increase from the current 450 horsepower that's on the current Raptor. I wow. mean, it's enormous. But that's you know, Ford, they don't want to mess around when it comes to their flagship. They sell so many F 150s, and this vehicle, the Raptor, or for Ram, the TRX, it sort of represents the, the brand in a big mm -hmm. way. Even though most people aren't going to buy that version of it, there's some bragging rights with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm real excited to see what the performance is like on this next model, but also sort of the bodywork and things like this, how they're going to make it feel aggressive to go up against that TRX. And we don't have to wait too long, February mm -hmm. 3rd. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is getting real close to flying passengers to space talking about april talking about yeah april space cool. tourism you're gonna go for a flight Sign or what me up. yeah it's, you're gonna go man i'll go blue origin completed the 14th test flight on its new shepherd rocket booster and capsule everything's going well it's working as planned it's one of these things where it goes it takes off it lands you know, just like the stuff Elon's working on as well. They're kind of competing uh, with each other for okay. who's going to yeah. figure this one out first. Although I don't think SpaceX is as worried with, about passengers right now. That's more Virgin Galactic. They're working right. on that as well. The flight was the first of two stable configuration test flights 
People familiar with Blue Origin's plans told CNBC stable configuration means that the company's plans to avoid making major changes between this flight and the next. So it's like basically everything goes perfectly. Hmm. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you can catch a glimpse at what the cabin looks like. Maybe a little more comfy than you might expect. Hmm. If you tell me, but I feel like I could do a little space flight in that one. Yeah, there's windows for each uh, chair. It's... Uh it's pretty nice. It here, reminds here. me of like a hot air balloon okay. kind of situation, like okay. adventure. You kind of go up into space and then you come right back down. That's exactly what they do. Actually, yeah. you sit there for a little bit, though. Okay. Uh, this is designed to carry people on rides past the edge of space. Your altitude is going to be 340,000 feet, which is uh, more than 100 kilometers. Then you're going to spend several minutes in zero gravity before returning to earth several minutes mm. in zero gravity fun that's gonna be cool massive windows will give you a view and then the rockets and the capsules are going to be reusable when you come back down i don't know if i'm gonna be the first person on there but and obviously the world is weird right now when it comes to any type of tourism uh -huh. but that's a futuristic attraction <laughs> yeah just a quick a quick one up to zero gravity for a bit imagine a view Bill Gates has become the top U.S. farmland owner. He's loving the farmland. You didn't even know that. Hmm, he's a farmer? I don't know if he's a farmer himself, but he's certainly interested in diversifying his holdings by picking up a bunch of land in Louisiana, Arkansas, Nebraska, and Arizona. He owns 242,000 acres. Nice. 70,000, just under 70,000 in Louisiana. Uh... Just under 50,000 in Arkansas, 20,000 in Nebraska, 25,000 in Arizona, and 16,000 in Washington State. Uh, he owns 52,000 more acres than the second place owner of land. And this leads us to have to figure out why he is so interested in owning land. I know it's hard to even picture what 242,000 acres looks like. He just likes to lie on the land. That's right. That's it. Just go out right to the middle yep. of the plot. Uh, land is good. Uh, you can't... Land is limited. And maybe when you're that rich, you run out of places to put your money. But judging from how uh, his entire position has changed so substantially post-Microsoft. I know he's still involved in Microsoft a little bit, but he's got all these other things going on now. He's big in the vaccines and he's big in the philanthrop philanthropy and all the rest of it. Uh, is there a food component here? Mm. A food Maybe. play? Because yeah. you got all this farmland, right? I mean, that's all I can really tell you on it. I don't know. Something sustainable. Sustainability. I would, I would but you know, the conspiracy theorists are going to say something evil is taking place here probably gobbling up all yeah. the available land so he can sell you his genetically modified superior food which uh -huh. is the only food that's going to be good for you windows food i'm just having fun right now uh -huh. bill don't take it personal bill i'm just joking around you got a lot of land you don't gotta worry about me what i say you got all this land man now you remember we were talking about that bitcoin situation the guy couldn't unlock it didn't have the password yeah well here's another one to add to that list James Howells, 35-year-old, he just chucked a hard drive with 7,500 Bitcoins in the trash. Why did he just chuck it out? No, that was in 2013. Oh, okay. I meant just like, oh, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Huh? He just casually it. chucked 7,500 Bitcoins in the trash, which is currently worth more than $280 million. 2013 he, was like the beginning of the rise, right? Maybe. Was it? Uh, I mean, you could bring up a Those chart if you there. want. <laughs> you could bring up a chart if you want. You want to know the craziest part of this story? What's that? He thinks he can still find it. Mm. He thinks that he can search the local garbage dump and it's in there still. And he thinks that the, the platter isn't damaged and he'll be able to retrieve. Oh, his, no. It started way later. His two, $280 well, million no. in Bitcoin. You, you got to go, You could, oh, that's all right there? Yeah. It's very flat, but it's hard to see the growth. Because of how big it is lately. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he, it was still worth a lot, man. 7,500 Bitcoin at 
uh, $700 a piece back then. Yeah. It was still not a thing you would want to throw in the garbage. Now, he says he had two identical hard drives, and one of them had nothing on it, and the other one had 7500 oh. <laughs> He threw out, threw oh, out the wrong one. Poor guy. That's rough. Two identical laptop hard drives. He's confident he'll be able to recover the Bitcoin. He thinks the external part of the hard, dri hard drive will be damaged or rusted, but that the glass platter may still be intact. Oh. Now, he needs the approval of his local council to search the garbage dump because they're like, that's dangerous, man. We can't let yeah. you in the town city dump. It's not open to the public. There's all kinds of uh, contaminated things in there. We can't let you in but there. But my bitcoins. He says... That if he gets it, he'll donate 25% of the haul to help out with COVID relief in the home city there. Well, that's about $70 million. So that's, he's trying uh, to make his case here. He's like, look, <laughs> uh, put something on it for you. Yeah. But they haven't let him in yet. And I still think, I mean, I still think it's a tough one as to whether or not he's going to be able to track it down, even if he gets in there. But I, I suppose anybody might do the same thing for $280 million. I don't think there's anything wrong with a person scavenging through a dump if they truly believe there's a shot at 280 million i think a lot of people would take up that challenge yeah just buy yourself uh, one of those suits hazmat suits you know what's curious though you read this story what if you work at that dump right now you're like oh i'm gonna start looking for that yeah. that's a treasure hunt right now right. granted they wouldn't be able to get into it but they could cut a deal with the man if they got it would that be illegal yes likely i'm not attempting to give anyone any ideas just call up your man howls and do it the right way i'm sure the guy has a crew yeah to help him search all right well good luck to everyone involved tv ratings the mandalorian finally beats the office in nielsen's streaming top 10 mandalorian beats the office will that was fast office is a long long time show yeah, but I think because it just hit on the streaming with yeah. the Peacock dealer. Was it Peacock? What, which streaming? Yeah, service? NBC. Peacock. Yeah. That's what they call theirs. Yeah. I, how am I going to remember all these things? Oh. Peacock. Come Peacock on. Peacock is a very specific name. Why don't they just call it NB Streaming? NBC. <laughs> <laughs> that makes no sense. That makes sense. That makes no sense. Peacock don't, is memorable, no? Don't 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 call it that. Peacock is memorable. It's a very honey. I'm watching name. some. I'm watching my peacock. It's. <laughs> I'm not saying it's. Uh, oh my God, aesthetically. Man. I don't know. I figure. get it that their logo and everything. I just I don't know. Anyway. Okay. For the week of December 14th, in which the season two finale of the Star Wars spinoff series delivered a healthy heap of fan service and its surprise cameo. Wow! Holy spoiler alert! Relax. This win marks the first time that a non-Netflix show landed at number one on Nielsen's streaming ranker. The Mandalorian also sets a weekly record for the Disney Plus series, scoring around 1.34 billion minutes of viewing time. That's oh. no joke right there. Uh, which beats the 1.31 billion minutes of viewing time across all nine seasons of The Office. All those bingers. See, The Mandalorian only had eight episodes times two. Wow. It's That's uh, really surprising. I watched The Office like twice or three times. Mm. Like the whole thing. What? And yet, uh, you watched the whole thing yeah. three times? Yeah. I'm Holy. a fan. I know, but that's quite a bit, Well, Well, yeah. I like the funny. It's nine seasons, man. Yes. <laughs> You're like, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was surprised that. Uh, well, I mean, but the Mandalorian, they put so some mo they put some money in it. Yes, they put some money on that. But who's rewatching it all this time? No, they're saying that this this dates back to when the season two finale came out. We're talking about December. The oh, numbers take a while to come I, in. Oh, so I thought it was um, like all together, the views. All time, maybe yeah. you're right. Nielsen's rankings are based on a number of minutes consumers who have access to streaming platforms are viewing during the week. Uh, let's see. Nielsen factors Hulu into its top 10 rankings. Here's this week's top 10. Yeah, all right. So it is still 
when is this article from? January 14th. All right. So it is still cooking. Hmm. Mandalorian is still cooking. One one million three hundred and thirty six minutes on the 16 episode total. Wow. It's number one right now. The Office is still number. Why does The Office say Netflix, though? This did they was before? Did they screw this up? Well, the the uh, Netflix had the Office, and then they moved to Peacock. Right, but it says here's this week's top ten. Is which it? which week will? Uh, they killed us here. This is weird, because it says like the previous week Nielsen's top ten for December fourteenth to twentieth. For the week of December fourteen, what? This is very confusing. Posted January 14th. Anyway, this is getting out of hand. Point being is, these are the popular shows on streaming right now and throughout December. Mandalorian number one, Office number two, The Crown is coming number three, Grey's Anatomy across 366 episodes is number four, Manhunt number five, Supernatural 327 episodes, sheesh. Virgin River, Criminal Minds, Schitt's Creek, and A California Christmas to round out that list of 10 and whatever period of time they're being ranked over. Uh, there's some heavy hitters in there. The Office was 192 episodes, Will. Yes, and you watched I am it, aware. And you watched it how many times? Around three times. Three times. The whole series. Three times 192. You're a super fan, sir. Um, and yeah. you're going to have to get a subscription to Peacock now. Yeah. 